Welcome back. In this video, I wanted to take a little bit of time to discuss uh, some Lagrange multiplier examples that I consider to be a little bit more difficult than uh, some of the other ones that you may look at. Our first one is going to be uh, applying Lagrange multipliers in the case where we have two constraints, and uh, the second one is going to be an application type example. Um, in the first one, I'm really going to focus primarily on the setup, and I'm going to leave uh, working out the final details to you. And then on the other one, uh, we'll go through pretty much the whole thing. So um, let's go ahead and get started with the setup of a two constraint problem. So in this example, we are going to find the uh, maximum value of a function f of x y z that is equal to uh, 2x plus 2y plus z and that this is subject to two functions uh, g of x y z equal to uh, 4x squared plus 4y squared plus uh, z squared and we're going to say that that's equal to 9 so this is our main constraint right here and then um we have a second constraint, h of x, y, z, which is going to be given by x squared plus y squared plus um, 4z squared is equal to 9 as well. Okay, um, so remember that in Lagrange multipliers, uh, the idea behind this is that the uh, gradient of the function that you're trying to maximize or minimize has to be some scaled value of your constraint. Well, we're going to take that idea and kind of generalize it a little bit to allow the inclusion of a second constraint here. And what we are going to solve is the system of equations that comes up when we say the gradient of f of x, y, z is equal to, well, first of all, lambda times the gradient of g at x, y, z. But then because we have this second constraint here, we're also going to consider a second term here, uh, just some constant uh, mu, same idea as lambda, but a different Greek letter, uh, times the gradient of h of x, y, z as well, okay? So same idea as a single constraint, but now we have two pieces that we're trying to account for with two terms that are here. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with setting up what the system of equations looks like. Uh, the gradient of f of x, y, z is equal to, looks like it's going to be 2, 2, 1. Gradient of g of x, y, z is going to be equal to 8x, 8y, 2z. And then uh, the gradient of h is going to be equal to um, 2x, 2y, and then 8z there. Okay. Uh, and it looks like I'm really not going to have enough room on this page to continue, so I'll set up my system of equations on the next one. Uh, but it's going to be based off of this right here, that the gradient of um, f is equal to lambda times gradient of g plus lambda or mu times the gradient of h. And what we're going to get from that as a result is uh, we're going to have a system of five equations. Uh, one for each component of our gradient, and then plus the two constraints. So our first one is going to be 2 is equal to 8x lambda. So that's from gradient of g times lambda plus 2x mu. That comes from gradient of h times mu. And then similarly, 2 equals 8y lambda plus 2y mu. And then uh, 1 equals 2z lambda plus uh, 8z mu. And then we have our two constraint equations that get thrown in here as well. 4x squared plus 4y squared plus z squared is equal to 9. And then x squared plus y squared plus 4z squared is equal to 9 as well. Okay, great. So um, the first thing that you want to do uh, when we're solving these systems of equations is really just check to make sure that you're not going to make any illegal moves by uh, accidentally dividing by zero. So we want to eliminate the possibility that, say, like x could be zero, y could be zero, z equals zero, mu, lambda, whatever, could be equal to zero. Um, so we notice actually pretty much immediately, though, that neither x nor y nor z can any of those be equal to zero. Because if, say, x were equal to zero, for example, we'd have two is equal to zero. 
and that's not good. Similarly here, two equals zero, one equals zero, those don't make any sense. So um, X, Y, and Z cannot be equal to zero. Um, we don't have any such guarantees for lambda and mu unless we want to start diving into some kind of messy cases. But uh, with the method that we're going to use to solve uh, the system of equations, uh, we actually don't wind up needing to worry about whether or not um, lambda and mu uh, can be equal to zero because we're never going to divide by them. So as long as we're not dividing by a variable, we don't have to worry about whether or not it can be equal to zero. Okay. So um, general strategy for approaching these types of problems uh, when you have this many pieces floating around. I am going to take lambda in this last equation right here, and I pick this one because it's actually kind of distinct from these two structurally, okay? So if one of them is very different from the other two, uh, see how we have a one here instead of a two, the two um, on the Z and the eight on the Z instead of the eight and the two like so. Um, that's really kind of the one that you want to start with. So we're going to start by isolating lambda in this case. And after I solve for lambda with that, I'm going to get one minus eight times Z times mu divided by 2z is equal to lambda. All right, so what am I going to do with that lambda? Well, I'm going to substitute it in to these two equations that are up here, and then maybe start rearranging and trying to eliminate mu, and we'll see what we can get from that. Because um, we're just going to start, uh, the goal is to kind of start whittling down on the number of variables that we're dealing with. So we've gotten rid of lambda, and we're going to do that by plugging this into here. So uh, these two equations here are going to become 2 is equal to uh, 8x times 1 minus 8z times mu divided by 2z at plus 2x mu. And then similarly on the next line, what I'm going to get is 2 is equal to 8y, 1 minus 8z mu divided by 2z and then plus 2y mu. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a little bit of simplification here, just get some, rid of some of these twos that are floating around and make the numbers that we're working with um, a little bit simpler. And I'm gonna get one is equal to two x, um, one minus eight z mu divided by z and then plus x times mu. And then similarly for the next one, I'm gonna have one equals two y, uh, one minus eight z mu divided by z plus y mu. Great. Okay, so we've managed to get rid of lambda. So now we're down to, well, looks like three, one, two, three variables in this one and three variables in that one. Uh, well, we wanna know about x and y. We don't really care about what mu actually is. So our goal in the next step here is going to be to uh, solve for mu in each and then set them equal to each other. Uh, so that way uh, we eliminate mu in that way. Uh, so solve for uh, mu in each equation and we are going to set them equal to each other. So that's where we're going with this. Okay, um, now I'm gonna begin the process of solving for mu and I'm gonna start with this first equation right here. So that first equation tells us one is equal to two X times one minus eight Z mu divided by Z and that's gonna be plus X times mu. So um, in order to get rid of mu, the first thing I'm gonna do is just multiply um, Um, this whole thing all the way through uh, by z, and I'm going to get uh, z is equal to uh, 2x, 1 minus 8z times mu, uh, plus xz mu, like so. Um, and uh, so from here, I'm going to distribute the, uh, or move that, uh, x z mu over to the other side, I'm going to get z minus x z mu is equal to, and then distributing this through 2x minus 16 z x mu right there. Um, so again, the goal is to solve for 
mu. So I'm going to move everything that doesn't have mu over to one side and everything with mu over to the other. I get z minus 2x is equal to 15, oops, negative 15, z, x, mu, because these both have x and z on them. Um, so this means that mu is equal to z minus 2x divided by negative 15 z x. Great. Okay, so we've solved for mu with the first equation, okay? Um, actually, the process of solving for mu with the second equation is exactly the same. So solving for mu in second equation works the same. And with that one, we're going to wind up with mu is equal to uh, z minus 2y this time instead of 2x divided by negative 15 z times y. Great. Okay, so um, we have these two expressions right here. Uh, they're both equal to mu, so that means that we are able to set them equal to each other. So I have... Um, z minus 2x divided by negative uh, 15zx is equal to z minus 2y, um, negative 15 divided by negative 15zy. Okay, this is actually a really common technique that you'll uh, see quite a bit, and uh, we'll look at a, another problem here in a second that's actually going to use a similar uh, problem-solving strategy here, where you solve for your variable and then, or for your your scaling term there, and then you wind up setting them equal to each other. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cross multiply here. So we get uh, z minus 2x times negative 15zy equal to uh, z minus 2y times negative 15zx. And when we distribute these through, we're going to see that a lot of terms are going to be the same on both sides. So um, we get negative 15z squared y plus um, 30xyz, and that's going to be equal to negative 15z squared x plus 30xyz. Now, we're able to cancel the 30xyz from each side, as well as the negative 15z squared that's on each of those two terms right there, now that those are the only things that are left over, and we get y is equal to x. Okay. So that simplified down quite a, uh, quite a bit there, and this is really quite useful because we're going to be able to plug this now into our two constraint equations to be able to kind of rearrange and get z in terms of one of these two, and then we'll actually ultimately be able to solve. So our two constraint equations, uh, we're going to go back to those that we were given at the beginning, uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, 4x squared plus 4y squared plus z squared is equal to 9. If I plug in um, I'm going to plug in x for y here, and I'm going to get that z is equal to, or z squared specifically, is equal to 9 minus 8x squared. Okay, and now I'm going to use that in my other constraint equation, and I'm going to get x squared plus x squared uh, plus 4 times 9 minus 8x squared is equal to 9. Um, combine like terms, rearrange things, move things over uh, to the other side, and uh, what you're going to wind up with ultimately is x squared is equal to 27 divided by 30, which means that x is equal to uh, the square root of 27 divided by 30. Okay, um, so that gives you x. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and let you take over and work out what y and z uh, therefore have to be. I guess, I mean, y is pretty obvious, right? y is equal to square root 27 over 30. And then I guess you can just plug that in for z squared or z, and uh, you'll get the rest from there. So, um, anyway, that's kind of the idea behind working with two constraints. So uh, that's the, the main setup, and a lot of the strategies that we saw here are really quite common. So hopefully um, that is helpful. And again, uh, you still have to plug this back in to get Z. So um, 
let's go ahead and turn our attention to an application example. And I've actually, I've already written that up here. Um, another piece of paper. So uh, this is kind of a, a generalization or like um, of a really common problem that you see in Calc 1, where you're given a box and you're supposed to cut out the little corners and stuff like that. Um, and you figure out, okay, what's the, what's the maximum volume I can get by cutting out the corners? Well, in this case, we don't have little corners that we're cutting out and we're not able to get everything in terms of one variable, okay? We have a rectangular box that has no lid and it's going to be made, we're told by the amount of material that we have for it, we're told that we have 12 squared meters to uh, make, or of cardboard to make this box. And we want to maximize the volume of this box, okay? So in order to be able to do this, uh, we want to maximize, first we should identify, well, what, are, what exactly are we maximizing? Well, we're maximizing the volume. And the volume is given by V equal to, if we look at the labels here, X times Y times Z. Okay. And so this is kind of like, a, if you looked at my other video, what's called the objective function is what we're trying to maximize or minimize or whatever. Um, and we have to have the constraint. Well, our constraint is that we have 12 meters squared of cardboard to be able to work with. Well, that's like the surface area of the cardboard. So we need an expression for surface area. So that's going to be, generally speaking, the area that we have will be the base of the box. So that's X times Y. And we ignore the top because we're told that it's uh, lidless. And then we have to add to it two short sides. So it's going to be two X times Z for that end and that end. And then we have the two long sides as well. Okay, so our goal in this, uh, in this case is going to be to maximize this. When it is constrained to this. So given a, uh, an, an equation and then given a constraint that specifically, this is all equal to 12. Um, we know that we're going to want to use Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so Lagrange multipliers in this instance is going to tell us that the gradient of V is equal to some lambda times gradient of A, because A is uh, describing our constraint equation. Well, let's compute our gradients, first of all. Gradient of V is going to be Y, Z, um, X, Z, and then uh, X, Y. And then our gradient of A is going to be equal to we're going to have uh, y plus 2z, x plus 2z, and then uh, 2x plus 2y. All right, so um, this is going to give us a system of four equations this time. And that's going to be that y, z is equal to lambda times y plus 2z. Um, xz is equal to lambda times x plus 2z. xy is equal to lambda times 2x plus 2y. And then finally, uh, our constraint equation here, 12 is equal to xy plus 2xz uh, plus 2yz. All right. So all we got to do, solve these uh, for x, y, and z. So um, the first thing that we want to do is just make sure that we're not going to accidentally divide by zero. So I do want to go through and make sure that nothing can be um, equal to zero. And so, well, I mean, first and foremost, I guess mathematically, you could probably say, okay, Y or Z or something can be equal to zero. Like, yeah, mathematically, sure, fine. Um, there's really not um, a whole lot of these equations that we'd keep well, actually, I guess like none of them could be equal to zero. But anyway, um, algebraically, you could figure out that they can't be zero. But you could think about this 
physically as well in the sense that if you have a box with height zero, you're definitely not maximizing the volume of your box. Like no way. So there's no point in even considering that case. So we're just gonna say X, Y, and Z cannot be equal to zero. And the other thing is since X, Y, and Z can't be equal to zero, this means that in turn, lambda can't be equal to zero. Because um, if lambda is equal to zero, then that would mean this side would have to be equal to zero. And we already said y and z cannot be zero. So we know that none of the variables we're working with um, are zero. And I'm going to go ahead and immediately apply uh, one of the strategies that we used towards the end of the last example. And that's going to be to isolate lambda in these two cases right here. We're going to set them equal to each other and then uh, do the whole cross multiplying thing. So. Uh, and I mean, like, you can kind of think about it as the same strategy as what we had earlier. Um, we had had that first step where we wanted to isolate uh, lambda using this last equation, but now we're actually already down to only one lambda or mu or something like that. So we can go ahead and apply what we did with the mu because now there's only lambda. So uh, lambda is going to be equal to yz divided by 2z plus y, and then... Uh, this equation right here gives us that lambda is equal to xz divided by uh, x plus 2z. Okay, so like I said, we're going to set these equal to each other, cross multiply, do all that stuff. So what we're going to get is that xz divided by um, x plus 2z is equal to yz divided by y plus 2z. And doing the whole cross multiplying thing, we're going to get xz uh, y plus 2z is equal to yz times uh, x plus 2z. And once again, if we distribute those all the way through, we're going to wind up with xyz plus uh, 2z squared or times x is equal to xyz plus 2z squared times y. So again, the x, y, z's are going to cancel from both sides. Now that these two are the only things left, that 2z squared goes away, and we're just left with x is equal to y. OK, so that part wasn't too bad. Um, the next step is what is really tricky to kind of observe that maybe you should do. And sometimes you have to get really creative when you're solving these systems of equations. We are going to notice that. By multiplying um, each of the terms in the original equations uh, by a certain uh, variable, we're able to make them all look really similar. So here, I'll show you what I mean. Um, so if we start with the system uh, yz is equal to lambda times 2z plus y, uh, xz is equal to lambda times x plus 2z, and then xy is equal to lambda times 2y plus 2x. Um, what I can do, this term right here, if I added an x to this one right here and multiplied all of this by y, multiplied all of this by z, then everything on the left-hand side here would be equal to each other. Okay, so I get x, y, z is equal to lambda times 2z plus y times x. So I took this first row, multiplied it all the way through by x. If I look at my second row, multiply it all the way through by y, I get x, y, z is equal to lambda times x plus 2z, y. And then for my last one, I have x, y, z is equal to lambda times x, oops, 2y uh, plus 2x times z. Okay, so now all of these are equal to each other. And what I can do is set say this one, for example, equal to this one. Um, so now I kind of want to like try to pick two that are different because I already know that X is equal to Y. So messing with these two really isn't super enlightening. But if I play with these two, it'll uh, it'll work out pretty well. So since they're both equal to X, Y, Z, I can set these two right-hand sides equal to each other. And I'm going to get lambda times, um, or I guess I'll work with uh, this first one here. It really doesn't matter. You can pick this one or that one. Um, you'll get the same result either way. Um, Lambda times 2z plus y times x has to be equal to lambda times 2y plus 2x times z. Um, so again, if we distribute everything through, uh, first of all, we're going to notice that the lambdas go away. And we are allowed to do that because we already said that lambda is not equal to zero. 
Okay. Since we know lambda doesn't equal zero, we are allowed to cancel from both sides. Um, and we get 2zx plus yx is equal to 2yz plus um, 2xz. Well, these two cancel from each side. And we know that y isn't equal to zero, so I can cancel one of those from each side too, which means that x has to be equal to 2z. All right. So now we have um, everything in terms of x. We know y is equal to x and x is equal to 2z. And I can use this to go back to my original constraints and figure out what the values have to actually be. Okay. Um, so we're going to use um, y is equal to x, which is equal to 2z in the original constraints. And what started as xy plus 2yz plus 2xz is equal to 12 now becomes uh, 4z squared plus 4z squared plus 4z squared is equal to 12. Okay. Well, um, add all those up, divide both sides by 12, and you are going to get z is equal to 1, which then means that x and y have to be equal to two. Okay. So, um, in this one, uh, we then know that uh, this has to be a maximum. It's really the only critical point that we've found. So um, it's gonna wind up being the maximum. And the dimensions of the box that maximize the volume based on this particular area here, therefore has to be two meters by two meters by one meter. And that's kind of the idea behind that. Um, the big picture thing here that I wanna point out though, is just that, okay, we had that idea of solving for one of the uh, one of the lambdas or the mu's and then being able to set parts of the equations equal to each other and then cross multiply to be able to solve. And then we have that kind of inventive trick of introducing new terms to be able to, uh, again, force that same idea of setting different pieces of our system of equations equal to each other. One strategy thing that I do want to point out, and this, this is the last thing that I have to say, um, is I want to notice something that these two problems have in common as far as their setup and part of what we get at the end. Notice how x and y are treated exactly the same throughout all of these equations, okay? If we swapped x and y here, we wouldn't notice. If we swapped x and y here, we wouldn't notice. x and y receive the exact same treatment in both our objective function and in our constraint function. The same thing happened over here with our general example. x and y are treated exactly the same here, they're treated exactly the same in this one, and they're treated exactly the same in this one. And what I mean is that they both have coefficients of two, both have coefficients of four in R squared, both have coefficients of one in R squared. Notice that in both cases here, X wound up being equal to Y, okay? Anytime that you see that you could swap X and Y for each other with no impact on um, how this would come out uh, because they are treated exactly the same in every single piece of the problem, you can typically expect that X is gonna wind up being equal to Y. So just something to kind of help you develop a little bit of intuition there as far as what answer you can expect at the end of these kinds of problems. Again, if they're treated exactly the same in each piece of the problem like they were here, as well as here, then you can kind of expect to get X equal Y at the end of uh, solving for those. So just something to keep in mind. Um, Hopefully uh, this has been helpful. There's a lot of algebra going on here, but um, just kind of wanted to point out some key strategies for approaching these kinds of problems. So anyway, uh, I'll see you next time. And thanks for watching.